Hi, I'm Alastair and this is part of a series of videos where I'm looking at ways that you can replace traditional button input into an Arduino with something touch-free and more COVID secure instead. In the first video I looked at an infrared sensor and then we looked at an ultrasonic sensor. In this video I want to take a look at this laser time-of-flight sensor instead. Here's how it works. So as you can see this module is really pretty tiny and the important component is this little chip here. This is going to broadcast a laser signal. It is going to listen to see whether that laser signal is reflected and it's also going to do all of the processing and communication of the results. Now we've got a bunch of pins here. If I turn it over you'll see the pin labels. So we've got VCC and ground. Then we've got SCL and SDA. That lets us know that this board is using I squared C to communicate. So SDA is a data line and SCL is a clock line. And these are standard pins used in the I squared C interface. Uh, on an Arduino, they correspond to pins A4 and A5. And you can use that to communicate with all sorts of different uh, common components. These two pins at the top, we're not going to use those in this particular example, but you can use them to kind of extend further functionality of this board if you want. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, plug the board into my connector here. And so, uh, like I said, if I turn that over, you can see I've got a VCC going to five volt. I've got ground to ground. I've got A4 and A5 going to the SDA and SCL lines. Now, there's no LED on this board to indicate whether it's working, but if I hold it straight at the camera, you can see this light flickering here. That's actually the laser signal that's being emitted from the board, and we're going to detect whether that gets reflected back. And the reason this is called a time of flight sensor is because this is a modulated laser beam which means that when any reflected light is detected we can measure the phase shift in the signal to get a pretty accurate indication of the length of time that the light travelled for and therefore the distance of the object that it got reflected off. Now what I'm going to do as before is I'm going to turn on my Arduino serial monitor uh, so I can show you the output being detected. So, um, as with my previous examples, if I just put my hand in front of it there, you can see uh, that my hand is detected. And as with the example of the ultrasonic sensor, I'm actually able to detect the distance as well from my hand. Now, I've actually set a, a, a max distance here of... 20 centimeters or 200 millimeters. If I hold my hand at that distance, you can see I can just activate it. As I bring it closer and closer, you see I actually get a pretty reliable reading, pretty accurate reading as well, much more uh, accurate than the ultrasonic signal I was getting. If I take my hand away, um, that stops completely. So I can quickly insert my hand, remove it, and again, you can simulate a touch button or a touch hold and then a touch release as well. So here's a fritzing diagram just to illustrate the wiring but it is worth noting that the component at the bottom here is slightly different to the one which I demonstrated in the video. Even though it uses exactly the same chip and it has exactly the same functionality and performance, uh, this one is made by a different manufacturer. And as a result, the board has got a slightly different set of pins and they're in a different order as well. So depending on where you get your sensor from, I'd always say you should refer to either the data sheet or any technical reference that comes with it or look at the labels on the board itself to determine which pin needs to be plugged into where on the Arduino. Don't just assume that it's going to be laid out in the same order um, that I have or that you might have seen in an image anywhere else on the internet, for example. Fortunately, the pins themselves are pretty easy to assign. So we have V in, that goes to 5 volts on the Arduino. We have ground, which goes to ground. 
and then we have our clock and our data lines. So uh, my pin here is labelled SCL for system clock. Sometimes that's labelled CLK or just CK as well. And that goes to A5 on the Arduino. And then we have the data line which is labelled SDA and that goes to A4. Now as I mentioned this is a standardised I squared C interface so you do have to use particular pins on the Arduino so on a Nano or on an Uno these are always A4 and A5 you can't just plug these into another set of pins and expect it to work if you're using a different microprocessor, so if you're on uh, a Mega or if you're on a Teensy or an ESP chip, uh, there will probably be an equivalent pair of pins. And if you refer to the data sheet for your processor, you can find it. But what you need is the I squared C pins for data and clock, and they go to SDA and SCL on the board. So here we've got the code that's running on the Arduino. And if you've been following uh, the last few videos in this series of touch-free sensors, this will probably look pretty familiar to you. Um, so we begin with a section of includes. So these are external libraries that we're going to add into our code. Uh, the first one, the wire library, this comes with the Arduino IDE itself and that is a generic library for any kind of communication with an I squared C device and then this second library here this is a specific library uh, just for the VL53 LOX sensor I'm using so this uh, library is made by Ardafruit um, who are one of the manufacturers that make a board based on this chip but it will also work with um, any other board that uses this chip as well so by all means do check out uh, Adafruit's module but uh, you can also use this library with other boards based on the same chip as well. Then we go on to the constant section so these are variables that are not going to change throughout the duration of the code. We'll define an LED pin and this is going to have a high signal written to it when an object is detected or it will go low otherwise and so if there's an LED on that pin it will go on or off. I'm using pin 13 which is the pin that normally has the inbuilt LED on an Arduino board attached to it um, but you could have anything uh, plugged into that uh, GPIO pin or you could assign a different pin if you want as well. Um, and then uh, as in our previous example when we were looking at the ultrasonic sensor we want to set a maximum detection range beyond which we don't want to listen for any objects. So this is to prevent the sensor accidentally being triggered by uh, anything movement in the background or you know an object that's really out of the range of what we want to detect. Because we're trying to simulate the equivalent of a, a button input here we probably want something fairly close to the sensor to make sure that it was a deliberate action by the user. So this is a distance in millimetres this time, uh, so 200 millimetres or 20 centimetres in front of the sensor um, I've used there but you can vary that to uh, whatever value you want to um, reflect how far uh, you want the user to be able to kind of uh, detect their input. Then we go on to some globals so we'll uh, declare an object that's using this Adafruit library. Uh, so this is going to be an object that's going to contain all that functionality which was contained in this library up here and that will just help us uh, access the functions that's going to detect an object and give us how far away it was. And we'll also uh, create a boolean variable called detected. This is going to keep track of uh, whether an object has already been detected by the sensor or not. Uh, so whether this is a new input or whether this is an old input that's still being detected continuously, we're going to use that uh, variable there. So we'll go into the setup function. So this function just runs once when the code first begins. Uh, we will initialize a serial connection and we will just output some uh, debugging information at the top. We'll say the file name of this script and also the date on which it was last compiled, so it's a bit like a kind of a version number. Um, that's just useful bookkeeping information. We'll initialize that LED pin which we're going to use as an output 
to indicate when an object has been detected or not. Remember that the uh, the sensor board that we're using itself, the VL 53 LOX board that we're using, doesn't have an LED on it. Um, so that's why we're using this LED pin here as an output. And then we will start the I2C interface. So to do that, we're going to use this begin method here. So we'll call the begin method on the LOX object and we will pass in the address of the sensor. So the way that the I2C interface works is that every piece of hardware on the network has to have a unique uh, address associated with it and it's always uh, in the form of uh, something like this. So some hardware manufacturers have got kind of particular assigned codes they use for particular devices. In some cases you can adjust this via a jumper on the board or via um, you know resistor value that you can connect. So this uh, sensor we're using here um, has a default address for I2C of a 0x29. Um, and if you haven't changed anything on your board, that will be exactly the same one that you use there. If for some reason, let's say you also are using, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, some sort of LED display or something like that, which also has that same address, you're going to have to change one of those devices to assign a different address to it. Um, so that might be, like I say, by setting a jumper setting or by making a solder bridge on the board between two components or something like that. So we'll call the begin method, we'll pass it the uh, address of the board we want to connect to, and if that is successful, uh, we'll continue. If it's not successful, so that's what this exclamation mark here is, that reverses the um, meaning of the function after it. So if, that, if we're not successfully connected, we'll just print out a little uh, serial status update, just so there's an error. But we'll assume it was successful, and we carry on. We've then got uh, three functions that correspond to the three different sort of states of input that we want to respond to. The first one is when a new input has been detected. So when that happens, what we want to do is we'll write a high signal to the LED pin to light it up. We'll output a message on the serial monitor and we will also set our detected flag. So this is this Boolean global variable which we declared up here. Uh, and we'll set that to be true. Um, the next action we'll detect, so this is when an input has been held. So uh, an object, you know, someone's hand or anything else was detected in the previous frame and is still being detected now, so it's still there, it's been held. And when that happens, what we're going to do is we're going to print to the serial monitor the distance away that that object has been detected. So you could use this if you wanted to have uh, an input and you wanted to tell whether something was getting closer to the sensor or further away from it, or if it was being held at a particular distance from the sensor, for example. That's where you could apply that logic uh, in this section of code here based on the value of the distance variable. And we've also got um, the case that an input has been removed. So this happens when there had previously been an object detected by the sensor but it is not detected anymore and when that happens we're going to turn the LED off by writing a low signal to that pin uh, we'll send a serial message just to say it's been removed and we will also update our detected variable to set that to be false and that means that the next time that we do have an object detected we know that it's a new input rather than just a continuously held input from before so then we go into our program loop. So this is the main program loop that just loops over and over uh, while we are running the code. And what we do on each iteration through the loop, the first thing we do is we record uh, this measure value. So this is a rather long variable name here, but what this is, is this is an object that's going to hold um, all of the output from the sensor in it. So the first thing we'll do, we'll declare that object, and then we actually need to um, sort of populate that object with the data from the sensor. So that's what this line here does. We call a function called ranging test and we pass the address of the measure variable in there. So we're, first of all, this is sort of creating an empty container to hold the data in. And then what we're doing is we're going to call this ranging test function to actually 
put the data into that container there. And once we've done that, that's when we can then apply our logic to see whether we've detected an input or not. So looking at uh, this measure object here, if the range status is not equal to 4, so that lets us know that we've uh, basically had a successful um, reading for the range, and if the range at which an object detected is greater than 0, and if it's also less than the maximum distance, which we defined right at the top of the code here again, so that was in our constants at the top here, so we've uh, got a successful state, which is that one. We are somewhere between zero millimeters away from the sensor and whatever our defined maximum was there. Well, that means that we have um, detected an object. If we hadn't uh, known about an existing object in the previous frame, so if we weren't previously detecting something, but now we are, well, that means that we've got a new input. So we call that input detected function that we defined above. Otherwise, if we have detected an object in this frame, but we didn't have one before, oh, sorry, but we, we did have one before, that means that we are uh, holding our input. So we previously had an input, we've still got the same input being held there, so we'll call the input held function and we will pass in the distance at which we are holding our input away from the sensor. Otherwise we fall into this block here, so this is the case that we are not detecting an input in the valid range in this frame. And if that's the case but we were detecting one before, well in that case the input must have been removed. So we will call the input remain, uh, removed uh, function up here. This is going to set the LED pin to low, print removed and set our detected back to false again which means that the next time an input it has been detected uh, we know it is a, a new touch and not just a continuously held one from before. And then finally we'll just insert a, a small delay in the code just to, to slow it down, conserve a bit of power and then we just repeat that over and over. So the functionality of a time-of-flight sensor is rather similar to the ultrasonic sensor we looked at in the last video. We're able to detect whether an object is in range of the sensor or not, whether it's held, and also get a more precise indication of the distance it is away from the sensor as well. The disadvantage of these modules over the ultrasonic sensor is that these are substantially more expensive. So if you don't need that uh, indication of the distance, then you're really sort of paying extra functionality that you're not really making the best use of. In the next video, we're going to be looking at yet another type of sensor, which is going to be a capacitive sensor. And that works in quite a different way from the other ones we've looked at. So we'll take a look at the advantages and the disadvantages that that offers. I hope you'll join me next time.